Welcome everyone for the episode four of How Languages Connect People. Here at the translations, we love languages and people and how they can grow and interact and evolve while using different languages. As always, our interviewer and host of the series, CEO and founder of Day Translations Inc., Sean Patrick Hopwood, will be interviewing several people connected to languages and to translation and interpreting worlds. On our fourth episode, we are speaking with Paola Bassanere. Paola is a freelance writer working remotely with a number of clients specializing in lifestyle, food, technology, and entertainment. Born in Italy, she spent several years in the UK and then moved to Ireland. Before working as a writer, Paola gained experience in the private sector companies and the public sector in the UK, as well as a train as a massage therapist running a successful practice in London. She is also a self-published author with books about lifestyle. Welcome, Paola, and it's very nice to meet you. And thank you. Good to see you all. Sean, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I will uh, welcome. Is uh, is uh, Paola? Uh, is it Bassanese or Bassanisi or how is that pronounced? Bassanese. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, I just uh, wanted to talk to you and uh, get to get to know you a little bit better. This podcast is about you know mainly people who love languages and linguistics. Um, that's the main thing uh, uh, about the podcast. It can go into a lot of different areas, but that's mainly the things I like to talk about. Uh, regarding that, uh, uh, where, do you have a passion for languages or where is, you know, your main focus when it comes to languages? When did you start, you know, getting an interest in languages? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. And um, well, to start with, when I was a child, I started learning English as a second language uh, while in Italy. Um, I didn't realize it at the time, but that was a smart move because uh, it served me well for my career. Um, so when I decided um, after university where I wanted to live, I decided to live in London because it felt almost like a natural um, move. Um, so I, and it, it turned out to be, you know, a self-fulfilling prophecy because I spent several years there. Um, and then when I was in, actually, before I moved to London, I also studied German in, uh, at university. And when I moved to London, then I studied um, in evening classes, um, Spanish and uh, Portuguese. Um, am I missing anything? No, Spanish and Portuguese, um, just for, uh, for holidays, really. So to, to recap, the passion started as a child, and then it, it, it kind of like, became larger and larger as the years went by because especially in London you're exposed to so many different cultures yeah. and uh, learning languages as we both know is a lovely way to connect with people it builds in instant rapport and also builds a level of trust that you can't usually guarantee when you're filtering communications through like a second language or you know some kind of not non-native language or etc of course there's um there's a role for translations and that also builds uh, bridges that um when when you yourself can speak uh, another language it really helps you to to progress so much more definitely i, I definitely agree with all those things um even if like because you know it's hard to learn an entire language but whenever you meet someone from another place and then you know you spend a couple of weeks trying to learn their language or some words they even open up to you. Uh, they open up to you more because you understand where they where they're coming from. You kind of get an idea of the concepts of their language when you when you learn some some things. You know. Um, so, what part of Italy are you from? So, I'm from Trieste in the northeast of Italy, near Venice. Trieste. Okay, that's nice. Um, yeah, I used to play a video game and uh, the Winning Eleven. It's a soccer game and. You, you learn about all the different parts of Italy and different parts because there's a team. For, they, they go so deep. Like you have the, the, you know, the Serie A, Serie B, and then they go like to all the lower leagues. And so there's a, each league has it in these small towns. And I think there was one from Trieste as well. So yeah. I, I recognize that name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Trieste is the name. Are you a soccer fan at all? Unfortunately not, so I'm afraid it's no. <laughs> But yes, so the local team is called Triestina. Uh, I have no idea the, the position right now, and uh, yeah. I apologize. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, I know. I'm pretty sure they're just not in the first, you know, the Serie A. I know that. Probably not. <laughs> yeah. 
but yeah, I love soccer myself. Um, so, um, so is that close to Switzerland or no? So basically it's closer to Slovenia. Um, okay. So like the, the region as such is uh, bordering with uh, Austria to the north and, and Slovenia to the east. Okay, so um, when you took your German classes, were you able to ever go to Austria and practice it at all? Um, <laughs> I only did a day trip to Austria. <laughs> That's so very nice. I, I tried to practice my very broken German. And of course, in Austria, uh, people are very specific about the use of language because there are slight variations, um, which I wasn't aware of at the time. Uh, but for a day trip, it was absolutely fine i still managed to fit myself <laughs> <laughs> that's wonderful so you speak um you know english obviously your english is wonderful in italian portuguese spanish and german Maybe yeah you know. but a very various uh, degrees of uh, proficiency um I, I remember in in our interview on my website that you mentioned that your German is quite rusty, and likewise, I haven't practiced my German in a long while. So even though I studied at um, a university for four years, I I vaguely remember a few words, but um, you know I wouldn't be able to strike up a conversation with a native, and uh, with uh, Spanish and Portuguese because I only took evening classes, literally just for the purpose of going on holiday yeah. um, and let's call it travel travel it sounds uh, much more sophisticated for the purposes of travel um, <laughs> yeah. uh, so you know as long as you can order your beer and your food you know you're fine um, mm. so it's yeah again um, the knowledge of uh, those two Latin languages um, is quite basic however because of the similarities with Italian I would find it quite easy to, to make myself understood, thankfully. Yeah, that, that's, that's wonderful. Yeah, that's it, it's a smart thing that I think everyone should do. Even if you just, um, if you're going on a vacation or anything, you know, just get a little book and read it on the airplane on your way there. It'll make your vacation so much more fun, you know, to be yeah. able to communicate with the locals at least a little bit. You know, I'm, I'm hoping to go to China soon. So I've been <laughs> studying China for a year now. <laughs> so, I mean, I've been studying Chinese for a year now. So, you know. I think right now I could get by and, um, you know, I could find out where things are and I could mm -hmm. ask where the restaurant is, or the bathroom, you know, so it will definitely make my trip a lot funner when I get the chance to go. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> yeah. So um, it, how did how did you start your business? Um, I understand well, you do e your, your website and e-commerce. Can you tell me more about that? So basically, um, I started the business 15 years ago and I've got three websites but two are the main ones uh, the main one uh, that i started off with when i was a massage therapist was energia and then the the second main one is digital nomad europe to cut a very long story short i worked in in, in consultancies and in the uh, civil service in the uk and i've learned a number of skills along the way uh, that enabled me to uh, start off my own company um, and then from, from there, I managed to um, set up first this uh, massage practice in London. And then I realized that it wasn't sustainable in the long term. And I'll, I've always been blogging about my experience anyway. So when I later on uh, went full time, just uh, being a remote uh, content writer, um, I came across the, the concept of remote working becoming more mainstream. Uh, although I've been doing it for a number of years, uh, back in 2017, when I started Digital Nomad Europe, I realized that it was uh, more in the press than it was before. And uh, it was at a time when I was considering my move away from the UK because of Brexit. Again, to cut long story short, uh, the UK voted in 2016 to leave the European Union, and I'm a European citizen, and I prefer to uh, live in another European Union country because you are treated uh, in the same way as the natives. So that, that was that. So in terms of the website Digital Nomad Europe, it contains information for digital nomads, about digital nomads, and I really enjoy um, 
the process of also interviewing different ex experienced nomads and, and people that also offer positions to um, remote workers like day translations. And uh, I found that uh, people really uh, enjoy reading th that type of content. That's wonderful. So you're, uh, you're helping people, digital nomads, who basically, they want to be able to work from anywhere around the world, right? Mm -hmm. So you, yes. do you have... Um, do you have a repository of, of like links and information where they like, if let's say someone in Italy wants to go work in Russia, you know, uh, would you, did they come to you for help or how, how does that work? That would be a little bit too advanced. And also it would be quite difficult to keep all the information up to date because it's constantly evolving, especially with regards to visa entry, entry requirements. We've seen it with the global pandemic that uh, visa and entry requirements, well, entry requirements to different countries have changed dramatically. And for, for nomads especially, they have to check on a daily basis whether they would be allowed into a country or out of a country. So it's impossible to really to keep abreast with all of that information. Um, the, the purpose of Digital Nomad Europe is to provide uh, useful information um, that is more geared towards maybe finding work and also uh, finding inspiration from, say, the experience of other nomads who have been successful in their fields. Yeah, okay. That's that's great. That's that's wonderful. Yeah, it sounds like it, it would be a really huge task to kind of like have a repository of information yeah. for everyone, you know, like what are the paperwork, what's the paperwork I need to do? What you know? What you know? All all the you know every, everything they need to do to go to another country. But yeah, so it, it seems like it would be a pretty big task. Yes. So, yeah. so you meet a lot of content writers in your interview. Um, what what kind of engagement? Uh, what kind of things do do you like to write about, or what kind of things do you like to put on your website or write for others? What is the what is the main focus of your content? So basically, with regards to the interviews on on the website. Um, I, I, the, the purpose is to provide um, inspiration, but also um, that kind of uh, insider knowledge that only experienced nomads or other type of uh, remote work writer, um, remote workers would have. It's sometimes it's more about avoiding pitfalls, avoiding making mistakes. Someone who has been there and done that will be uh, very generous in sharing their experience of you know, what they would have done better or differently. And I think, especially if you're new to that type of environment, uh, that the information is extremely valuable. In terms of the, the work that I do on a day-to-day -day basis for content writing, so the work that I do through the Energia uh, website and company, my business, um, because of my past experience as a wellness provider, I, I write a lot about wellness, um, health, nutrition, um, even foraging, and um, and that triggers all sorts of ideas because then one thing leads to another. And for example, every time I go foraging, foraging is when you go and search for wild uh, edible foods. It could be, yeah. say, wild cherries. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> The easiest thing to, to identify. Um, and then I would come up with like a recipe, uh, maybe drawing from different types of cuisines. I, I still have this vivid memory of this mwah, wild cherry uh, tartatar that I did. So it's a French recipe with like local ingredients. And uh, it was very cheap to make because, you know, cherries are actually very expensive. Yeah. But well, there is a free, it, it's just your own labor cost. <laughs> <laughs> you got to find it. But it, it, it's one of those things, it, it's like your brain gets activated in so many ways. Uh, and yes, uh, I, I may not be the most coherent in terms of a person, in terms of the content that I write. But as I said, it's like an organic process. Um, the way I experience things, I want to write about them. If I learn a new skill, I want uh, to, to share that with other people. And, and I found that every time I share something from my own first-hand experience, the content really resonates with other people and gets a lot of uh, traffic as well. Oh, that's that's good. You get a, yeah, It's good that you get a lot of traffic. It's wonderful 
that your ideas can like can have some you know resonance with other people i love that and i really like um i was look, checking your instagram account as well and i was seeing uh what you write about it, the pictures you you're giving up plants and stuff that you you know you're foraging for and i think that's really cool i i love to do the same thing but i actually kind of got away from foraging when i when it's something that i used to love a lot i was a boy scout when i was little and we learned a lot about you know which berries you can eat which berries you can't and um, the kind of method, like, you know, you taste it and, and then you wait a couple hours to see if it kills you or not. <laughs> and then if it doesn't, then you can keep eating it. <laughs> you know, or, or if, it, you know, you get a little bit of it, you know, it makes you feel sick, then you don't, you obviously don't eat anymore. These are some things that we learned in Boy Scouts. But um, as ever since I bought a home, I actually started, you know, planting a lot of edible um, mm. food. Uh, I have a Barbados cherry tree. I don't know if you know this, this one. Oh, but, um, no, I haven't come across it. Yeah, it's it's a really sweet it's a really sweet cherry. Um, has a little bit of tartness to it, but depends on how how ripe you let it get, of course. And it, you know, it's it's really nice. And um, I got some um, blueberries, and I'm gonna start doing vegetables pretty soon. But um, I've never I, I've never thought about foraging. Do you like? Can you like forage around you know a city area, or do you have to go into the forest in order to be able to forage? Well, you can even forage in your own uh, backyard, to be honest, because there are some um, some weeds that, you know, like, you know, those uh, little bit of green bits that we tend to uh, uproot and get rid of. Uh, some of them can be quite tasty. I mean, <laughs> some of them are um, an acquired taste, like dandelion, which is quite bitter. Uh, but for example, the flowers, uh, they're like yellow and um, they, they um, taste like honey. So you can make a lovely uh, syrup with that. Um, the list is endless. But yes, to answer your question, yes, you can go foraging in a city. I used to go foraging a lot in London. You, you just have to make sure that the area is not polluted. Uh, there are no contamin contaminants either in the air, water, or the soil. So you have to avoid, say, an industrial estate, for example. Yeah. Uh, here in Ireland, uh, although it rains a lot, I still haven't found many mushrooms, which is quite upsetting. But I think <laughs> it's because of the area where I live in. Um, I would have to uh, travel to other areas of Ireland to find delicious chanterelles and even puccini mushrooms. But that's for another day. <laughs> yeah. I've noticed when it rains, um, if you have really good soil, just mushrooms will just start popping up in yeah. your soil. That's yeah, what yeah. happens in my backyard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Yeah, I love, I love that stuff. Um, yeah, I, I really, I really want to learn more about that, and it's really cool because you seem to have like a very um, earthy and organic way of life, but at the same time, you're helping people become entrepreneurs at the same time. And I think yeah. that's a really, that's a really beautiful balance to have. You know, some people think, you know either in life you have to be left-brained or right-brained. I'm not sure which one is which. I think the right brain is creative and the left brain is a more analytical per uh, person. But I think that's a kind of like a limiting idea. Uh, you can be both, you know. You can be, you know, one, of, you know, one with nature and also one with modernity at the same time. And so that's kind of like how I like to live. And it's very nice that you're, you know, helping people <laughs> with your, um, you know, learn learn about, you know, nature and also learning about business and I, yeah, exactly. with that with regards to foraging for example as i mentioned as soon as i learn a new skill then i want to share it out with the world so i, yeah. I publish a book with my uh well food recipes <laughs> yeah so you've published your recipes yeah okay uh, and um and how do you how do you distribute your your books uh, it's through Amazon, you know, very standard way of uh, of doing things. Um, there's like a facility whereby you can upload your file to Amazon directly, and then they just uh, show it out to all the different platforms. Mm -hmm. And do they uh, do you have audiobooks as well, or just written? Uh, no, just written. Yeah. That'd be cool. Interesting to get the audiobook too. <laughs> so, how <laughs> many books do you have published? Uh, I've got four um, published. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how, um, when, how long have you been living in Ireland? So uh, I've been living in Ireland for three years now. Yeah. So I bought my own home as well. And I've got like my backyard where I grow my vegetables. And um, it's 
it's very rewarding, I have to say, when when you don't have to unpack things from uh, plastic packaging, yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know you 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 dig your hands in the soil. Uh, like for example, the most rewarding thing for me this year to to grow was uh, potatoes. So I was digging in the soil. You know, it's very organic. And um, <laughs> I and love I got actually potatoes. putting my hands in the dirt too. Yeah. <laughs> well, I usually wear gardening gloves, but. It's just the motion, probably, that is quite satisfying as well. But yes, um, you know, it, it's just like um, a, a different relationship with food because you you appreciate all the effort that you you do you do it yourself, yes. and then you appreciate the nutrition that you're getting from the food because you know there's no pesticides, you know, no contaminants, and. Yeah. Uh, and of course, in, in your head, everything tastes better, even if it doesn't. <laughs> you, you, <laughs> you're probably, you know, wishing it, it, it would taste better. I think my potatoes tasted exactly like the potatoes that I had bought uh, at the supermarket. But it's the um, the level of satisfaction that is much higher, and uh, and the fact that um, there's no middleman. You, you're just there. Yeah. You've got full access to all this uh, beautiful produce. Yeah. It's amazing. It gives you this feeling of independence, but also yep. a, a unity with nature, and kind yep. of like, that's kind of what makes us feel more human in a way. And yep. and I try to keep that you know balance too with my company. I always try to tell my employees, you know, go out into nature every weekend, enjoy it. You know, go to a river or go to the mountain, go to the beach. You know, I, I like I personally live in Florida, so it's very easy just to jump into yep. a river and just go swimming with the manatees. <laughs> everyone knows everyone knows we have a lot of alligators here, but um, we get used to it, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I guess we just, um, they don't really bother you too much. Um, but yeah, I, I actually, um, I'm going to start actually planting some more stuff. I have a whole section of my yard, which is very amenable to something like that. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, there's not a lot of, you know, I don't walk there a lot. So I'm, yeah, that's why I keep my cherries and my blueberries. I'll probably do some more of that. <laughs> so have you picked up any Gaelic living in Ireland? Okay, I have a confession to make. No, I haven't. I mean, in my defense, um, it, here it is not compulsory. Well, it is taught at school, but um, it's not compulsory to speak it. So, um, like on a day to day basis, people don't speak Gaelic. And um, you only hear it uh, maybe in the news sometimes and uh, on public transport. Uh, I also use public transport a lot. And although I'm used to the sounds, I haven't memorized anything, but I only know the most important word in, in Gaelic, which is slonte. Which is beautiful. <laughs> yeah. having a toast, <laughs> so that's very important. And then um, sometimes you see on road signs, or uh, or even sometimes outside some shops, uh, is slan avalie, which means safe home, so safe journey home or safe onward journey. Okay, that's, that's basically it. That's that's, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> and it's interesting to know. So they actually still um, give the advertisements and everything in the in the airports to get the warnings in, in, in Gaelic? Yes, 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 yes. I think that's wonderful to always try to preserve your language. I mean, that's I one thing. Yeah, we have, a, we have an organization that our corporation, our company started called GUPL, the Global Global, Global Unit, Unit um, Union for the, the Global Union for the Preservation of Languages. And so that's what we're working on right now. It's an organization um, to try to help all these languages stay alive because I believe when you keep the language alive, you can help keep the culture alive, and and that's that's something I love. So yeah, that's really nice. Um, so out of all these things, how do you how do you spend your free time? You doing what you love or what? <laughs> yeah. So as I mentioned, yeah, I I love my gardening and you know uh, tending the, the the vegetables and stuff, and I do like my exercise. Uh, it could be anything from home workouts to going to the gym or for a swim or walking. Um, but um, you, you probably know it yourself, uh, movement really helps with uh, brain clarity as well. So especially when you have to um, write something, when, when you have a creative job, you need to clear out the cobwebs and a nice swim or a nice hike uh, really hit the spot. Um, 
So, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, sometimes my cooking goes up a notch and I create some kind of weird concoctions that thankfully are not disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that can be quite a laborious process. Um, and, you know, it's always good to, as, as you said, to be self-sufficient. I actually haven't ordered anything in, in, in years. Um, I could call my own meal. So um, I feel quite proud of myself for that, to be honest. That's great. Yeah, you look very healthy. It looks like you eat a lot of good food. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> so what, what are your goals in the future? Uh, what do you want to do with your business or languages? Uh, what, what, is your, what are your goals for the future? Well, you know, what I've learned from life is that um, you just have to adapt. So... Um, um, I'm not saying plans are always disrupted, but um, I am a bit wary of making plans, especially in the past year when things have been very uncertain. Um, so I would say mostly I would like to expand the reach of my website to make sure that, of course, I generate more uh, traffic and more people can benefit from the information contained on the website. And... Um, and also personally, in terms of languages, I've been toying with the idea of maybe picking up French. I, I'm not sure just yet, but it, it's just one of those things because I've got a few friends who are uh, francophones. And uh, I mean, we wouldn't be speaking French between us because we speak English or sometimes Italian, depending on the person. But um, it's one of those things, um, as you mentioned, um, is the cultural references. Um, just to give you an example, just recently I was working on, on a project uh, where I used my Italian language and um, and I was watching like a random um, program that was streaming online in Italian and I realized the, the cultural references can be missed if you haven't lived in Italy and uh, to be able to relate to people uh, who maybe have been grown with a specific culture, if you can maybe reference maybe a TV show or anything like that, maybe from pop culture, it, it builds rapport. Um, so, yes, it's one of those things um, that really connects people. So, yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah, I, I, really, I really love learning about these things and cultures. I actually speak French myself mm -hmm. and um, it's, it's a wonderful language. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I was thinking, you know, the group, the Gypsy Kings. Yeah. Oh, are they from France or Italy or where are they from? You know, <laughs> I hope this, they're from Spain. Uh, should I just do a quick Google search? <laughs> well, I'll search it right, really quick. Oh, um, um, the uh, director of uh, communication says Spain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think they're like they they they're a very international group. That's why I like them so yeah. much. They sing in Italian. Well, thank you, Alejandra, for for the tip off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they they yeah they um they they sing a lot of different um, stuff. So yeah, mm -hmm. that's that's yeah that's wonderful. So um, yeah, I I really I really have enjoyed speaking to you. Um, do you Likewise, to thank you, Sean. <laughs> so what what um, what are the names of your websites? So hopefully we can expand them even more. So uh, the, the website where I talk about uh, digital nomads uh, is called digitalnomadeurope.com and my main website where I talk about health and lifestyle is called energia.co.uk um, and you can also find me on Instagram, it's Paula Energia, P-A-O-L-A-E-N-E-R-G-Y-A. E-N-E-R-G-Y-A, -E yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Energia actually... Um, uh, 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 sorry, quick brainwave. Energia you know. is a uh, is is kind of a, a, an homophone, uh, both in Italian and uh, and and Portuguese. Uh, when I went to Brazil, people were using the word so many times. Energia, energia. Well, it, it, it's kind of a, an homophone. Uh, is the pronunciation of the G is different, but uh, people really connect with energy. And they they're very positive. It's all about positivity, and um, 
and and that that what inspired the name of my company and um and i and i i'm having another brainwave like it, brazilian portuguese is, is one of those magical languages and it has one word that is absolutely amazing it's called saudade mm -hmm. which is untranslatable it means a sense of longing and nostalgia um uh, it could be something that you haven't experienced even. So yeah. nostalgia is usually something that you have experienced and, 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 and you're missing. Uh, but uh, this feeling of longing and it's kind of a mixture of sadness, but also a bit of pleasure because you're, you're, you are in this constant emotional turmoil, but yeah. it, it's kind of quite interesting to experience it. and. It, it, sometimes it also, also propels you forward to experience new things. So I think it's a fascinating concept. Yeah, it's a beautiful concept. Yeah, I've heard that one too. It's it's beautiful. They say saudade de você. So yeah. <laughs> some people like if they're just missing someone, they can say it too. So yeah, I love it. Um, it that's that's beautiful, and it, it is interesting. Sometimes there's not a direct translation of a word. You have to use yeah. like a whole paragraph to to explain it. <laughs> And yeah. even then, you, you you have to put them in the situation for them to understand it. So yeah, it's it's beautiful. That's a beautiful word. Thank you. So um, yeah, I I really appreciate this. I I appreciate having the time to speak to you, and um, I just um, I hope that your website grows. I hope that your plants are continue to grow, and Thank you. Can, you know you you continue maybe learn a little bit of Gaelic, a little bit of French, and that we can talk again. Fantastic. Thank you so much for this opportunity, Sean. I really appreciate it. And thank you, Alejandra, for the voice in the ear, you know, uh, <laughs> background information. Yes, thank you so thank much. Thank you, Paula. It was nice to meet you and nice to have with us. Thank you so much.